Good morning. I'm glad you're here with us today. Although, again, I'm here by myself, it seems like. Charlie's back in the back, and, and, uh, and he's smiling real good, so maybe it's a good day for everybody. I hope it is. I hope it's a good day for you. Uh, we've been talking through the Gospel of Luke, and we've been doing that for several weeks, and we're continuing our study of Luke this week. And, and this week, their story, it really touches home for me. Uh, this week's text is Luke 5, 17 through 26, and it's about Jesus healing a paralytic. You know, uh, my dad was paralyzed in an accident when I was a very young boy. You know, for the last 18 years of his life, he lived in a wheelchair. He was paralyzed from the waist down. He had limited m mobility, and he needed help with some of the simple tasks like bathing and dressing or, or getting from point A to point B. But he wasn't totally helpless. Let me share a story. Years ago, I had a 1967 Oldsmobile Cutlass SS convertible. It was red with a white top, and I was really proud of the car. I liked the car a whole lot. One day, my dad suggested that I drive him up to the hills, which is in the, for us, that means around Poughkeepsie up there, where the family's from. He suggested I drive him up there so that we could hunt together, and I said, okay. So, so we took off on this bright fall day, and we drove up to the hills, and we drove to the place, and we were... I don't know, about a mile and a half from any real roads down this logging road, and, and there were a couple of right-of-ways there, and I parked the car so that he could look down the right-of-ways in either direction, and, and he could hunt from sitting in the car there. And then I went about 100 yards or so down the hill and sat down on a log so that I could watch and see if a deer happened to walk by me. And everything went fine to that point. But then something happened differently. It was kind of amazing. The day got really exciting. My dad, when he drove his vehicles, had hand controls. They looked kind of like a, a motorcycle controls. He had a bar that he could push that would operate the brake, and then he would twist it like you do on a motorcycle to push the gas pedal down. Dad guy was in the car, and as he was in the car, he decided that he didn't like sitting where he was sitting, and he wanted to move a little bit. And noticing that there was a small branch that had broken off a tree lying on the ground beside the car, he opens the car door, manages to lean out, and get a hold of the branch, and using the branch, he was going to be able to push down on the gas pedal and push down on the brake pedal, and thus operate the car. So he starts the car and starts down the road. The next time I saw my dad, from the time when I walked off into the woods, was as my car comes careening down the side of the mountain through the woods. My dad is sitting in the passenger seat still. His face is white, his hands are white. He's got one hand on the steering wheel trying to steer over here. He's got the other hand over here with a stick in his hand trying to jab at the brake pedal and stop the car. Luckily, nobody got hurt. Luckily, there was no major damage to dad or the car or to me or to anyone else. But there shouldn't have been any danger at all. You see, he had help available. I was less than 100 yards away. He could have honked the horn and I would have come up there and driven him wherever he wanted to go. This narrative in Luke reminds us that all of us need a little help now and then. So let's look at this text today. Luke chapter 5, beginning in verse 17. Now it happened on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Then behold, men were brought, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. And when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the housetop and let him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst of those before Jesus. When he saw their faith, he said to him, Man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Rise up and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he rose up before them, took up what he had been lying on, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. 
And they were all amazed, and they glorified God and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. And they had. The narrative today talks about four different kinds of people that we see, and, and we see them in the world today, and they, they were in the world then, and they're still in the world now. The first are the helpless. The man here, the paralytic, represents the helpless. He had, he had become an object of pity. He couldn't move around by himself. He, couldn't, he had lost his independence. You know, I've had several friends through the years who've suffered strokes, and I've watched some of them were massive strokes, and, and they didn't make it when they had their strokes. Others had minor strokes or really mild strokes, and it resulted only in a, a quick visit to the hospital and maybe a little bit of therapy. Most have been somewhere in between. And what I've noticed about strokes is that a stroke paralyzes you. I don't know why this guy is paralyzed, but a stroke paralyzes you. And in some cases, the victims can't speak or respond even to communication. And in almost all cases, mobility is impaired to some extent or another. And in every case that I know of, the victim becomes dependent on others, at least for a period of time. They can't take care of themselves completely. Bathing, eating, communicating, and mobility all require help. And eventually, depending on the amount of damage that's caused by the stroke, sometimes quickly, sometimes not so quickly, the body begins to relearn how to function a little better than it was or maybe back to where it was. I've heard doctors explain it as being like a baby learning to control its body, to touch, walk, speak, eat, things like that except it's not really that easy. The baby's learning for the very first time how to do these things, and what happens is, as the baby's eyes focus and it tries to reach, it learns to reach. A stroke victim can't control that reach, but they know what they're supposed to do to reach. So now all of a sudden, they know they're supposed to do this to reach, but their arm doesn't respond to that. And so they have to not only relearn how to do that, they have to unlearn everything they've learned in their life up until that point. And some are never able to make that full adjustment and that full transition. This guy, in our story, in our narrative, this guy's paralyzed. We don't know why, but it's like that. But he's also, like us, a sinner. And as such, he's a representative of mankind in general, this broken man, this helpless man. Because, you see, sin is like a spiritual paralysis. It makes us inert without the ability to say or do the things that we should. It, it interferes with our right thinking and sometimes takes control of our bodies when we give in to the passions of, of sin. It stops us from being able to do the things we know we ought to do or say the things we ought to say. And it interferes with even the basic functions of worshiping God. When we're overtaken in our sins, sometimes it is so hard. We, we don't feel like praying. We don't feel like studying the Word of God. We don't feel like going to church. We feel dirty. We feel ashamed. Like Adam and Eve, we try to hide when we hear the voice of God walking in the garden with us. John 5 and verse 40 says, Jesus says there, You're not willing to come to me that you may have life. You're not willing to come. See, when we're caught up in sin, we're just not willing to come and have life. And in Luke 13, 34, he says, he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou who, who murdered the prophets. And then he talks about how, he, how often he had longed to gather them together like, like a chicken gathers or like a hen gathers her little chicks to protect them. And Jesus is saying, I want to, but you're just too stubborn. You're too hard-hearted. Sin has gotten such a hold on you. And this guy represents that for us as we look at this text. The next we see in the text is the healer. You know, there are a lot of sick in the world. There are, there's all kinds of sicknesses, everything from the COVID-19 to diabetes to heart disease to kidney, lung, and pancreatic issues and to, to cancer and all of its ugly forms. And, and there's, there, there are also many people who are emotionally unwell. You know, and, and that's not so easy to spot from the outside. I have an acute fear of heights. There's no reason for it. There's no reason that I know for it at all. The other day we had an issue up on our roof and I set the ladder up and I started up the ladder and I got almost to the top of the ladder and I was done. I ended up hiring somebody to come and do the work because 
I could not climb the roof anymore. I was terrified climbing the ladder. I know it's unreasonable. I know it's irrational. I know that when you look at me, you wouldn't say, well, there's a guy that's afraid of heights. There's no way you would know that unless you knew me. Even to sometimes much deeper things, such as severe depression, to someone else's loneliness, to another person's hopelessness and brokenness, these internal emotional things don't show up like paralysis does or like a broken arm does, but they are just as debilitating. There are others who are spiritually unwell, and that's even harder to diagnose from outside. You know, they go through the motions sometimes, they put on the happy face, they, they act like everything's just peachy, and, but inside they're broken and lost, and they don't have a clue what's going on in the world around them or in life or about them, and they, and they're, they're, they know they're lost, but they don't know how to find their way out, and they're, but, but they're going through the motions and pretending like everything's okay. For all of these, whether it's for the one with the physical malady, whether it's for the one with the emotional malady, whether it's for the one with the spiritual malady, there's only one healer. You know, in Matthew 9 and verse 12, Jesus said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but the sick do. He's eminently qualified for this job. And the reason he's so qualified, first off, is because he's sympathetic. You know, a couple of weeks ago, we saw him at Peter's house, and, and, and after this big day at the Sabbath, and, and, and he comes back to Peter's house, and the mother-in-law is sick, and Jesus cares enough to heal her. And then we saw his concern for the lost and the reluctant, and he calls to his disciples, and he says, hey, you know what? There are lots of people out here who are lost, and, and, and we need fishers to go out and catch men. I know you've caught fish before, but you need to catch men because there are lost people out here. Last week, we saw him touching, literally and figuratively, a leper and healing him. You know, here's a guy who's gone for no telling how long without a human touch. Here's a guy who's been broken in spirit for no telling how long, and Jesus reaches out and touches him. And here today in our text, he's healing people at the house. People are crowded around. It's crowded so much they can't get through the crowd is what it says. People are crowded around looking to see what's going to happen. Some of them are there to be judgmental. Some of them are there to be healed. Some of them are there just to see. Some of them are there because there's, it's the big show in town. And in the middle of all that, he's not turning anyone away. No, he's sympathetic toward their needs. And it's interesting, he's not upset by the interruption of this helpless man. You see, our healer has the remedy. His word was enough. He said, arise. That was enough. That's all it took was arise. You know, Psalm 107.20 says he sent his word and healed them. And he delivered them from their destruction. Romans 1.16 tells of the power of the word of God. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God, the gospel of Christ, the words about Christ is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also for the Greek. And in James 1 and verse 18, of his own will, James writes, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. The word of Christ is powerful. The word of God is powerful. In this case, the word in and of itself was enough to heal this man. Arise. There's more to it than that. And, and, and I know that in the past, oftentimes, when I've preached on this particular passage, we go to the idea of, of him saying your sins are forgiven and the Pharisees questioning that. And, and, and that's part of what's going on in the text here. But what I want to focus on right now is the power that he has here because he possesses this divine authority. His authority was attested from a voice from heaven. When he was baptized, a voice from heaven spoke saying, this is my son. He was attested from heaven and it's proven by a miracle right here. Again, the Pharisees are sitting there, they're watching it. They said, why did he say your sins are forgiven? Nobody can forgive sins except God. He's blaspheming. He's claiming to be God. He's claiming to be able to forgive sins. And, and Jesus, knowing their hearts, Jesus, knowing what they're thinking in their hearts, Jesus says to them, basically, your words are true as you testify about me that I am the Son of God, because truly only the Son of God, or only God, 
can forgive sins. And that's what happens in this story. You know, if someone told you that they could get on a tightrope up on the ceiling or up on the roof up here above our building and walk on a tightrope from here across the street over there to the library, to the public library, you might believe them, you might not believe them. You might think they're crazy for trying. You might think that, hey, anybody can do that. I don't know what you would think about that. But if they then strung a tightrope across there, climbed up on the roof, walked over there, and turned around and walked back on the tightrope, you would believe that they were capable of doing that because they've proved to you they're capable of doing that. These Pharisees, these Sadducees, these judges of people, these witnesses heard Jesus say the words and then saw him perform the miracle. Should they not have believed in him and believed in his power? Don't you? Wouldn't you have if you had been there? They saw the proof. They saw the evidence themselves. The third group of people we see here are the helpers. Oh, we need helpers in life. We need helpers so much. These are the friends of the paralytic. They couldn't heal him, but they could do the next best thing. They could bring him to somebody who could. You know, we don't have the power to save sinners, but we can bring him to the one who can. You know, just as we see here, the, the prime mission of the church is not to feed the hungry. It's not to clothe the naked or free the captives or anything like that. The prime mission of the church, those are all good works, but our prime job is to, to reach out and teach people about Jesus. You know, I have a book at home, and it, it's, it stays. I actually have two copies. I have one in my office and one at home. And even when I don't read the book, which I've read several times, but even when I don't read it every single year, I always see the title. Speak a good word for Jesus. Speak a good word for Jesus. You see, we need to be out in the world speaking a good word for Jesus. We need to be like the friends of the paralytic. We need to be like the, the friends of sinners. We need to be like the friends of someone. When we see someone that's hurting, we ought to be able to reach out to them. We ought to be able to touch them. We ought to be able to share with them the words of everlasting life, the words of hope, the words of healing, the words of Jesus. Because while I can't heal them, any more than the friends of the paralytic could heal him, I can bring them to the one who can heal them. I might not be able to heal their depression. I might not be able to heal their pain. I might not be able to mend their brokenness, but I can bring them to the one who can. And that's part of the message and the mission that he's given to us. You see, that's what these friends were doing. They were bringing him to someone who could help. We see four things about him as we look here. First, we see their love for the man, and we need that kind of love. It was their love that caused them to bring the man to Jesus. It was their love that caused them and allowed them to climb up on the roof. Now, to me, that's scary, that part, the climbing up on the roof and, and dragging somebody with them. I mean, it's not just them climbing up on the roof. They're responsible for this guy that can't take care of himself. Maybe a couple of them climbed up on the roof, and then they threw up a rope, and then they lifted him up, and the others came up. I don't know how it happened. But somehow or other, they climbed up on the roof. They got the guy up on the roof. It was their love that caused them to tear through the roof. Now, I don't know what the situation was in that day and time, but today, if you go to somebody's house, like Charlie's back there, and, and you start tearing through the roof, he's going to expect you to fix his roof. So when they started that, they had to understand that they were going to have to fix the roof. And it wasn't like somebody says, well, it's just straw, and they, they pulled the straw. No, it says there were tiles. It was a tiled roof. It was a strong roof. They had to break through the roof to get to him. And it was their love that allowed him to do that. It was their love that lowered him down in front of Jesus. And likewise, today, it's our love that causes us to go over through whatever obstacles and overcome whatever things are in our way to bring other people to Jesus. It's our love that does that. It's because we love our sister, we love our brother, we love our cousin, we love our friend, we love our neighbor across the street. We love that person that we go to school with or that we work with every day. It's because we love them and care about them and see their hurt and see their need and see their helplessness that we say, let me bring you to someone who can heal you. Let me bring you to someone who can fix that brokenness within you. Let me bring you to someone who has the answers to whatever your need is. I love the way the lady at the well puts it when she runs back to her town. 
She comes back and she says, come and see a man who's told me everything about myself. Come and see him. She's so excited she can't help but to bring people to Jesus. And thus we ought to be, thus we should be. We also see their faith in the healer. You know, it's pretty amazing. It's their faith that motivated them to act on their love. There's no end evidence anywhere in the text that the man, the paralytic himself, believed. We don't know whether he believed or not. But his friends believed. Maybe they had heard of Jesus. Certainly they've heard of him or they wouldn't be there. Maybe they've heard him teach. Maybe they've seen some of his miracles. Maybe they've been there at synagogue when, when he spoke or something like that. They had so much faith in Jesus that Jesus noticed their faith. He looked up and seeing their faith said to the man, your sins are forgiven. You see, he saw their faith. He recognized their faith. This isn't some kind of faith healing. It's not, hey, this guy was just emotionally, he's, he's, a, he's really, he's emotionally paralyzed and what he needed to do, he needed to have enough faith and then he could be healed. It doesn't say he had faith at all. It says they had faith. When we bring people to Jesus, we need to have enough faith to recognize that he can heal them. You know, sometimes we study with people and we get the idea that, I'm not sure even Jesus can help this person. But there is no one he can't help. Sometimes maybe we don't initiate a study with someone that we could study with simply because we're not sure whether God himself has the power to forgive this person because they are so bad or because they've been so wrong. But we're not the judge of that either. Our job is to have enough faith to recognize that the healer can heal no matter what the problem is and then to bring the broken people to Jesus and say, here he is. Here he is. And let them work it out there. We see their cooperation. There's no struggle at the door or argument about who has to climb up on the roof first or anything like that. They had a friend in need, and they just went together to meet that need. That was their job. That was what they were there for. They were there to help a friend, and, and, and they weren't arguing about who was going to be first or who was going to be next or who was going to do whatever. This last Tuesday, we had a storm come through, and when the storm came through, one of our ladies in church lost her storage building. It got blown over, and all the all the contents were, some of them were scattered out. Most of them were still inside, but they were all spread out and about to get wet and damaged. So Wednesday afternoon, a group of guys from the church, about a dozen guys or so, shows up at her house. Nobody was arguing about, well, let's put the stuff in my truck, or let's put the stuff in your truck, or, or let me be the first one to carry that, or let me carry that because it's too heavy for you to carry. Let me get the glory. Let me get the honor. Let me do this. Let me. Nobody argued about any of that stuff. Instead... A bunch of willing hearts and willing backs picked up pieces here, there, and yonder, put them in trailers, put them in the back of trucks, carried them over, and put them in a safe, secure storage place for her so that her belongings wouldn't be lost and destroyed. It took about an hour and a half because there was cooperation between those working. You know, as we go out into the world and we're trying to show the world the love of God, Jesus didn't say, by this will all men know that you're my disciples if you take communion on the first day of the week. Jesus didn't say, by this will all men know you're my disciples if you don't use an instrument when you're worshiping. Jesus didn't say, by this will all men know you're my disciples if you show up every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, Bible class, and Wednesday night. Jesus said, by this will all men know you're my disciples if you love each other. If you love each other. And folks, if we don't love each other, if we can't cooperate with each other, we can't get the master's work done. But if we do cooperate together, we can bring people to Jesus. We see their determination. You know, the door's blocked, but they found another way in. A friend of mine's a Marine, and he says, the Marines have been trained to adapt, adjust, and overcome any obstacles. Their prime objective was to get their friend inside to Jesus. You know, their objective wasn't just to give him a ride to the house, but to get him to the healer. So they surmounted all their challenges, and they went through the roof. They just found another way to do it. But then we see this other group of people, the hinderers. There's always someone. Satan's the great hinderer. 1 Thessalonians 2 and 18 says, Paul says, We wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us. Hey, Satan hinders us. And there are plenty of naysayers for any project that gets done. If you say, 
we're going to do thus and so. Somebody's going to come up and argue that you don't have the resources to do thus and so, and thus and so has never been done here before. If you turn around and say, we're not going to do thus and so, the exact same people are going to come up to you, and they're going to say, well, we've always done thus and so before, and resources has never been an issue before. Do you not have enough faith to do thus and so? Here in the text, we see two classes of hinderers. The first class are those that are, they're the onlookers, the bystanders, the crowd. They're just in the way. They're not intentionally trying to hinder him. They're just in the way. And sometimes Christians can find themselves in this category. Actually, but not intentionally, they get in the way sometimes of people coming to Christ. And the second group's the active hinderers. They don't want this guy healed if sin is mentioned. You know, they're, they're, they're opposed to Jesus' work because it disagrees with their theology. I've got friends today who claim to be followers of Jesus but wouldn't let Jesus preach in their pulpits at their church because Jesus says you have to be baptized and they don't believe that. And so they wouldn't even let Jesus preach in their own church. They're actively hindering people from coming to God. So the question is, what group are you a part of? Are you, well, you can't be the healer. That role is already taken. But if you're helpless, you need to be seeking the healer. And if you're a hinderer, you need to become a helper. Because we all need to be helpers, helping people to come to the healer. That's our lesson for this week. Now our communion meditation comes from Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. Look at my thing here. Starting in verse 55. Now when evening had come, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be given to him. When Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock. And he rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. And Mary Magdalene was there and the other Mary sitting opposite the tomb. On the next day, which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together to Pilate, saying, Sir, if we remember while he was still alive how that deceiver said, After three days I will rise. Therefore, command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say to the people, He's risen from the dead. So the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard. Go your way. Make it as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure sealing the stone and setting the guard. But we know that's not the end of the story.